Pacers really look like a young team on Wednesday as they lose to the Knicks in a game that still had a lot of encouraging stuff happen. Some good performances from youngsters getting a lead in the fourth quarter just to lose. Plus, Gabe York debuts for the Pacers this season. And we got to look at the schedules of the teams the Pacers care about down the stretch. There's a lot of interesting games, including one tonight between the Spurs and Blazers for draft positioning. It's all coming today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers. Your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, Pacers Knicks, we're diving into the Pacers' second to last home game, their third to last game of the season. A loss by the Pacers, and quite frankly, the perfect game for them, given their situation that they're in the season. They're eliminated. Losses are better. This was a competitive loss. Good performances from a lot of their young players, some stuff worth building off of the debut of a new player, but it still ends with the right column of the win-loss column at this stage of the season. We'll get to what happened in that game. Gabe York's debut, which I thought was uh, pretty solid. Career high in points and showed some interesting stuff, but still has more to show in these last two games. And then we'll talk about the five teams that the Pacers should be looking at down the stretch and their schedules and how the Pacers care about their spot in the standings and why it all matters. And this draft lottery is going to be crazy. And there's so much to get to. But we start with Pacers next. There's a score of this game. It was 138-129. It does absolutely no good in telling you what happened in this basketball game because the first five minutes and the first and the last five minutes, excuse me, were just all over the place in this game. It completely buries the lead of this game. The Pacers were up seven to four. They looked strong to start for a second with nine and a half minutes to go. And then they were down uh, 21 to seven. 14-0 14-0 next run in that first quarter. So six minutes into the game, the Pacers are down, well, 12, really. They scored right before the end of that six minutes. So the first six minutes of the game, the Pacers lose 21-9. to That's a 12-point stretch. The last six minutes of the game, the Pacers are up by three. They're up 115. They're up two. They're up 115-113, excuse me, at the six-minute mark, and then they lose by nine. So they lose those minutes by 11. So the first six minutes of the game and the last six minutes of the game, the Pacers lost those by 23 minutes, and they won the other <laughs> uh, 36 minutes of the game by over 10 points, right? They were pretty solid for the late first quarter, all the second and third quarters, and the early fourth. They were up by a pretty significant amount in the early parts. Significant to stretch. They were up by a decent amount early uh, in the fourth quarter of this game, I think their biggest lead was four or five, right? TJ McConnell was doing that thing he's done the last couple of games where he's just so good at a late stretch stage of this game that you think, oh, they, they could actually win this if he keeps playing that way. Like McConnell had five points and three assists and was a plus nine in five and a half minutes in the fourth quarter, right? That's the third straight game he's done it. But when he came out and the starters came back in to try to put it away, the Knicks took it over. And that was the story of the game to me was the atrocious start by the Pacers who... You know, Rick Carlisle said that part of their plan, they had to adjust right away, right? That was a big issue for them in this game. But not only after the adjustments were their problems, turnovers were why they couldn't get this game done in the end. A lot of ugly stuff for the Pacers in this game. They look disconnected in a way that they haven't, even with this lineups and rotations in recent games. Turnovers were gross. 17 of them in this game. That's not like an absurdly high number, but I think it sells them short in terms of impact and and timing. And 12 of them came in the second half of this game. The Pacers actually shot the ball really well in the second half. 50% from deep, 54% from the field. Great numbers, but because they turned it over so much, especially sometimes in critical moments, matter that they were putting the ball in the basket they were still destined to be playing from behind or be playing catch up the Knicks were just flying up and down in transition you know that last four six minutes stretch I referred to earlier really the last four minutes the pitchers were ahead entering that last four minutes stretch the pitchers had five turnovers in that four minutes and two or three of them were just bad inbounds passes head scratching like you know that is not a, a typical way to have a turnover moment maybe once in a game but two or three times is where you go whoa what's what's going on here and The Knicks ball pressure was impressive. Their switching in defense was like, it was hard to get it in. I understand that, but just very unusual stuff 
for the Pacers in the turnover department in this game. And they weren't like the, the usual variety of just like an aggressive pass and a turnover. They were just sort of lazy plays, right? They had a couple of guys, uh, Nembard and Matherin combined for 10 of them, right? They had a lot. Those two specifically were working through some kinks and really struggled in a way that really hurt the Pacers. So if you had to boil this game down to three areas where the Pacers need to be better, the start, the finish and the turnovers and Carlisle is correct in that those are the three kind of moments. Well, the, the start and the finish specific, I should say are where you can learn the most with a young team like this, right? Starting a game is different than coming off the bench, especially for the Pacers with a lot of these young guys who are playing in bigger, more expanded roles than they have all season. They're getting a big opportunity with these opening five minutes playing together as a unit, right? When things go South, when you have a game plan that isn't, perfect or when you aren't playing well to start a game they were up seven to four and then they were down 14 in a flash right that's not something that can happen to you if you're coming off the bench so how do you respond how do you what do you do differently what does that mentally take to overcome and they got benched uh when they were down 21 to 7 or maybe it was 20 21 to 9 either way the, the starting line have got benched and they responded right they played well but that's learning experience what does that feel like what does that require you to change what does that mean in the halftime locker room what does that mean for your lineup situation for the rest of the game that of course matters and then not unique to this game but still a factor from this one is these late game situations right are, are critically important for every young player who's getting time to play in them because there's you're going to be in countless late game situations in your career in the nba most of these young guys have been in a bunch for the pacers this season so any more reps are good there they got them against okc i think they were in clutch time for a little bit against the Cavs, even though the Cavs ended up running away with that game. But they've had a lot of reps in that way recently, and that's really valuable. And it was, again, in this game, the turnovers. Look, th this game, they were so unusual that I'm almost inclined to say that they were just something was off. But, you know, that, that's a never-ending goal, cleaning up turnovers. And the Pacers passed the ball very well in this game, 33 assists. In fact, this is a big positive in general was their balance, right? This is the second straight game this has actually happened. They have several double-digit point scores. They had seven in Cleveland, and they had seven in this game. Eight in this game, excuse me. And the two guys who didn't reach double-digit, Brissett and New York, were one bucket away. Right? Tons of players in double figures, but no one hitting 20 points. That happened in Cleveland as well. Their leading score then was Mather with 19. Jalen Smith led the way with 19 in this one. That is impressive in a way, right? That is good that they're sharing the ball so well. 33 assists is fantastic. That's part of their assists is they're trying to move the ball so much. But also, like, someone needs to put their stamp on the game and, and maybe reach 20. The Knicks had three guys reach 30, right, in this game. Their offense was three guys in 30 points, 14 for Mitchell Robinson, and everybody else a, a low factor in the scoring department, right? So the Pacers' balance was impressive, and it, it's been a, a factor for them all season. But I think a little bit more of a stamp from one player would go a long way. Jalen Smith was great in this game. He continues to be good. I'll have a story on him probably up Friday. Uh, eight for 11 for his 19 points. Uh, three offensive rebounds, two steals, three blocks. He was really effective as a center. Uh, plus minus bogged down by playing with the starters, but in his stint without them, it went very well. TJ McConnell, like I alluded to earlier, was good again. The less he plays, the more likely it is the Pacers lose at this stage of the season, given how well he's playing. 18 points, 12 assists for his sixth double-double of the season, plus 13. I mean, he is just... He's kind of everybody. He can get to the basket. He can get to his spots. He can score. He can distribute. He is the best at their identity of their available players, and it shows when he's out there by just how this team plays. And I think the big takeaway beyond all the little things that the young players can build off of is this is exactly what the Pacers should, or maybe, maybe not want, but this is a, a pretty good blueprint for these Pacers games is competitive, lots of learning moments, but they still get the best draft lottery outcome, right? This game was close. They were ahead. The crowd was involved. They were engaged. They got a lot of serious moments. There were adjustments. They had a bad start to learn from. They had a bad close to learn from. They got a lot of lineups on the floor. Ten guys played in this game. So lots of learning. Lots of learning was done in this game. And lots of key moments that they can learn from and think back on when they're growing in the future as young players. But also the loss will help the Pacers long term. It, it, it sucks that that's the system the NBA has presented. But hey. Here we are, and the Pacers do lose. They're now 34 and 46 with two games to go. Pistons Friday, Knicks on Sunday. We'll, of course, be breaking those down as they come and talking about the schedule in the third segments for both the Pacers and a bunch of teams close to them in the draft lottery standings because that is critically important for them 
down the stretch. Another thing that happened in this game, I, I mentioned his name just in the scoring department. Gabe York debuted the two-way player who the Pacers signed last week. Eligible to play in the Pacers' last three games because of his two-way stuff, and he did play. What did he do? What did he not do? What was said about him? What can we look for in these next two games? We'll get to all that in this second segment. Before we do that, though, I got to talk to you guys about Ibotta. Watching your closet grow after purchasing all these late season trends for clothing. I have a lot of hangers and a lot of clothes and not a lot of room. How about also watching your cash back grow with each purchase with Ibotta? You can earn cash back on every shopping trip. Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce to personal care to pantry goods. Either link your loyalty account or upload your receipt after you shop and get cash back. It's that easy. The average Ibotta user earns 120 bucks a year in real cash back that can cover the cost of a whole shopping trip or use that cash back by the flight you've been eyeing the game you've been dying to go to, the fancy dinner you've been craving, a typical basket of groceries. It's over $50 more expensive at the end of 22 than the beginning of the year due to inflation. You can earn two and a half times that in cash back from Ibotta or even more depending on how much you use the app. It'll give you real cash back, not points like other apps, real cash back that you can use into your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. You can earn cash back. Hundreds of online brands and retailers when you start with Ibotta, Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, for Best Buy, and more. For example, so right now, Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A, is offering our listeners $5 just for trying it. Use the code LOCKED when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play. Download the free Ibotta app and use that promo code LOCKED, all one word. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or the App Store and use that promo code LOCKED. Thank you, as always. For making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today and every single day. Different second listen this time than usual. Uh, I was on a million podcasts this week, setting the pace. Uh, the Blue Wire guys with Alex Golden and Michael Focci. We had a great time talking about the Pacers youngsters. And we did a draft of people named Tony. I did not pick myself. Nobody picked me, which was correct. But it was really fun. And I had my favorite pick of the draft with my final pick. You should check that out at setting the pace. And I also... Went on the Sideline Guys podcast uh, with Jeremiah Johnson and Pat Boylan, two of the Pacers' uh, sideline reporters this season. Jeremiah for, of course, Valley Sports. Pat working more with the Pacers uh, and the fever side of it. It was really fun. We covered a lot of ground talking about me, which was <laughs> unusual. But also, again, the Pacers' young players, their growth this season, the fever a little bit. It was really fun. Check out both of those. If you can't get enough of the Pacers' content as their season winds down, let's talk about Gabe York, who made his debut for the Pacers' On Wednesday, the the short of it, if you haven't been caught up with the story, is on two-way deals, you're eligible to play in 50 games over the course of a full season out of 82. That is prorated to whenever you're signed. So if you're signed with 41 games to go, you can play in 25 games. Or if you're Gabe York and you sign with five games to go, you can play in three. So he didn't play in the first two after the Pacers signed him. He is now eligible to play down the stretch. And he did play in this game against the Knicks for his Pacers debut. Always fun to see a new body, a new skill set, a new anything. Just see how it meshes with other players, see how that player themselves does. It's all just another evaluation point for the Pacers and for Gabe York, who only has two games of NBA experience leading up to this, both with the Pacers last year, right? Like this was his first home game ever, right? Both of the games he played last year on the road in Philly and and in Brooklyn, and he, he's barely been on an NBA roster for, what, four days last season. He's already exceeded that this year. Like this is a huge moment for him. To, to have this opportunity. He'll get it again Friday. And then he gets a road game in Madison Square Garden. Like, this is all a big experience. And so not only are you seeing how a guy like this plays, but how does he handle this sort of situation where the gravity is significantly different than maybe it ever has been in his pro hoops career? It's all It all matters. And it's all worth discussing as you look at what he does. I asked Carlisle about his performance after the game. He finished with nine points. We'll talk about all that in a second. Uh, and Carlisle said, I love Gabe. What's not to like about the guy? The guy's consistent. He's loyal. He's got a skill. I'm assuming he's referring to his outside shooting. York took like 10 threes a game in the G League and hit about 40% of them. And he was always kind of a shooter, but he really, really, really grinded it this past year. And it shows. And then Carlisle continued. He said he knows who he is as a player, knows who he is as a teammate. Him banging in those threes in the first half were huge. He's been a real staple for the Mad Ants the last two years. That's all true. Uh, York won G League Player of the Week three times this year, which is the first time that's happened to G League in like eight years or something. He was on fire so often, but he applied those skills immediately to the NBA, right? Carlisle was dead on. First quarter, Gabe York checks in, <laughs> and he gets the ball on the left wing in transition, and he tries to drive to the basket, and Mitchell Robinson swats his shot into the second row. And I thought, ooh, forcing a little bit in that welcome to the NBA situation. And then his second shot was a left wing through that didn't go in. 
And then he got three in the corner in a row and drilled all three of his threes. He was three for five from the field at that point. When he finished three for seven, he was 50%, three out of six from deep, and it was just a quality floor spacer. And that's why, look, when you take six of your seven shots from deep and hit half of them, that's going to be the skill that I think your coach is referring to, especially when you were good at that in the G League as well. But that's going to be something worth watching with York because – the Pacers haven't really had a guy who can be that level of off the dribble three point shooting besides Tyrese Halliburton this season. Buddy Heald's got a couple of those one dribble moves and Gabe Yorks were mostly catch and shoot in this game. But seeing him step up to that level was significant. Both of the Pacers chances in this game and for his debut in, uh, with the team this season, just they were getting smoked when he came in the game. I think they were down like 14. They were down 18 at one point in the first quarter of this game and they tied it up in the second quarter and York was a big part of that. He was leading the Pacers in scoring because of the way he was being, he, uh, he hit those shots in the first quarter, the running three cut it to 13, his second three cut it down to 10. The third three came in the second quarter that cut it to single, cut it in to the single digits, right? Like he scored nine points in like four minutes that it was really impressive. Uh, he did not score the rest of the game, which was a bummer. I was hope, I always hope that guys, you know, who have had sp- sparse opportunities in their career can have like a I scored a double digits thing to say or something like that but a nine point game a career high for Gabe York in this game as he hit those three threes it's gonna be fascinating to see if that shooting from the G League can continue to be a weapon for him at the pro level I mean that that is not, not the only way but if you're a guy who's on the fringes of the NBA right having a skill like a high level skill that other NBA teams can go oh we need shooting hey we can call Gabe York like that's really important and that just so happens to be a crucial skill that every team is looking for. He showed it in this game. He was more of a scorer than just a shooter in the G League as well. You know, like that drive he had where he was blocked, like that, he did that kind of stuff a lot with the mad end. It's just not as many opportunities for it when McConnell has the ball so much, rightly so, in this game. But he buried the shots. McConnell, of course, was really happy to see Gabe York do well in this game. Like you could see McConnell helping him out with some pointing and telling guys to get him the ball and, and helping him out. But they, like they were teammates at Arizona, right? Almost a decade ago at this stage, they go back a pretty long way. And I think York's scoring skill is going to help this team, even though the only move he tried early uh, wasn't successful when he got hot and started going for it. He was successful and that's what he can do, right? He can really shoot it. He proved that this year in the G league and in the first Pacers game, three out of six from deep. Are you kidding? That's exactly what the Pacers will want to see. It was funny. Someone asked after the game, like, I think it was Scott Agnes, but if it wasn't Scott, sorry, Scott, he, he took six threes and he hasn't even played for the team this year. He's fitting in. He's finding a way. Like, does he already have that kind of green light? And Rick joked and was like, everybody has a green light on this team. If you haven't noticed, uh, which is true. A lot of guys do shoot a lot, which they should. Uh, but he was on fire in this game going that three for six. And the fact that he was able to step right up and do that is impressive. That said, remember, this is an evaluation point of the season, right? And if you're a 29 year old Gabe York, obviously, again, having a resume of, look, I can be a good shooter in the NBA is very valuable for him and his career and for the Pacers and their continued evaluation of his skills. You also always want to see guys explore their game, add to their game, show a little bit more maybe than you thought they could or show something that goes, oh, he's grown significantly and X, Y, Z ways in the NBA level and the time he's gotten. And so York, one assist, one rebound in this game. Those are his only non uh, uh, points stats, right? I would like, there's not going to be a lot of chances for this just because of who else is available for the Pacers and New York will likely be playing with in these last two games, but a few playmaking opportunities, right? How do those look? Can he set up anything? with the ball in his hands? Can he run a pick and roll that gets the big a shot or, you know, makes a hockey assist happen? Or can he, can he score in a way that is consistent and isn't reliant on the threes? And look, threes are worth points and are valuable. And so if that's your thing, that's your thing, but more is always better. And so seeing kind of what else he can add, I think will be valuable at this stage. And can he be a guy who elongates his career beyond this season. I think adding to his game will be important to do that, even though he already has a high level, like Carlisle said, skill, and he showed it in this game. And that's a great baseline of, of, of skills to show for this team is, hey, look, if I'm on the court, guys, like I can shoot just as well as you guys, even though I'm new and I know where I need to stand and how I can fit it and how I can help. And impressive start, nine points, one rebound, one assist. The Pacers will take that. And York, of course, getting a career high, playing in front of a home crowd for the first time. He'll take that as well. It'll be fun to track how he does in these final two games, both because uh, he's new to the league and because tracking the shiny new thing (laughs) is fun and it involves more storytelling, which I enjoy. Um, The NBA is in 
the weird stage of the season where everybody's fighting for a seed or for a draft positioning or something, a lot of them kind of got clinched on Wednesday night. But the inverse standings are still nuts. The Pacers heavily involved in that. Can they get up higher in the draft lottery standings? Where could they end up? What's their situation right now? We'll get to it all to close it out and look at the schedules of the important teams around the Pacers. Before we do that, though, I got to talk to you guys about FanDuel. The NBA playoffs almost here. Now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. Right, You can hop on into the spread money line bets and games. You can do player props like points, rebounds, and assists. Exclusive bets like FanDuel's 2x3, two 2-made three, two threes in the first three minutes of a game. And FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets. You go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thank you, as always for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Lockdown Pelicans. Pelicans clinched a play-in spot. That's obviously worth discussing, but Pelicans-Grizzlies was a bananas basketball game. I caught the end of it after getting home from Pacers Knicks, and uh, the Pelicans somehow blew a six-point lead in 11 seconds, and the Grizzlies had no timeouts, and then they still won an overtime. <laughs> it was crazy. Jake Madison at Lockdown Pelicans or even Lockdown Grizzlies be a good place for you to go. The inverse standings are insane as they have been all season, but particularly now with just a few games to go and every team's goal is extremely obvious. Of the teams with the worst 11 records in the league, one of them won their last game, the Rockets, right? The Pistons have won 11 straight, and then every team, 3 through 11 in the inverse standings, lost their last at least one game. It's a, I hate the way that the NBA has this system where April games are just dumb. Um, but not all of them are dumb. There were some awesome games in the NBA last night. I just am complaining. Um, there's a lot of important games for the Pacers in that way going forward because Pacers tied with Washington in the inverse innings. There's two teams within a half game of them. Their second round pick is kind of in jeopardy just given how other teams have played. Their other two first round picks are mostly settled but not really because the Grizzlies did in fact lose today as I alluded to to start this segment so let's dive into all that not looking at the Pacers own schedule and standings like we do for standings watch sometimes because they'll try what they can down the stretch of the season in terms of development if they win they win if they lose they lose but the three teams around them are critically important Portland Washington and Orlando they are all right in the thick of it with this. The Pacers 34 and 46. The Wizards are 34 and 46. The Blazers are 33 and 46. They've just played one less game and won that one less. And Orlando's 34 and 45. They've played one fewer game, but they won that game. If they lose their next one, they would be tied with the Wizards and the Pacers in the inverse standings. Tiebreakers, for those unaware, in the inverse standings are not settled by a traditional tiebreaker like it is for the standings, like head-to-head -head and all that. Instead, it's just a coin flip. And whoever ends up higher is the team that will end up higher at the end of the lottery, and the lower team ends up lower. It's that simple. Uh, but they split the odds. So if if it's the Pacers and Wizards who end up tied, and uh, the, the sixth draft lottery spot is a 10% chance at the top pick, and the seventh lottery spot is an 8% chance, then they both would have a 9% chance. Those odds would be split, but a coin flip would determine who'd be higher if they both get jumped in the lottery. That's how all that works. So the Pacers would like to get under all these teams if they can. Well, I, that's what I would imagine they like. I guess I, no one's told me that specifically. Um, so getting the highest odds you can, the highest pick you can, always extremely important. And so what's going on with the other teams around them? The Wizards have the same record as the Pacers. The Wizards close with two games. They play the Heat on Friday at home, and they play the Rockets on Sunday at home. That Rockets-Wizards game, one of the two biggest games remaining of the season for the Pacers. They're not even involved in it. If the Wizards won that game, that would be huge, 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 huge for the Pacers. Not only would the Wizards get a win, but the Rockets would get a loss. That game is huge. Um, there, there's a chance the Heat clinch seven, and they're not trying in that Friday game, so maybe the Wizards could get wins along the way here. We'll see how that ends up going. But the, the Pacers, huge Wizards fans on Sunday when they play the Rockets. The Magic, who have, again, 34 and 45. So if they lose their next game, same record as these teams. 
They play the Cavaliers on Thursday and then at Brooklyn on Friday and then at Miami on Sunday. There's a chance that every team the Magic plays is playing for nothing and is not trying. The Nets might have to try uh, on on Friday. So if the Cavs are resting, guys, they've clinched four. They're going to be fourth in the East no matter what. Thursday could be a winnable game for the Magic. And if the Heat are resting, guys, in their finale, because they've already clinched seven, that could be a game the Magic could win. But the Magic also, in theory, would like to lose these games. So th- they are another tough one where it's possible they lose all three. But it- it's so hard to predict these games when, you know, you never even know who's playing for either team. We already saw the Pacers play the Knicks, and the Knicks were without their two stars. Pacers play the Knicks again. The Pistons are their next game, right? There's not going to be a lot of star power in those games. The Blazers, fascinating team who have just gutted their roster to have other players play and lose. Uh, They're a half game ahead of the Pacers at 33 and 46. Pacers would love to see them win at least once in their final three games. Perhaps twice would be even better. Um, Biggest game of the Pacers season, not named Wizards Rockets. It's tonight and it involves the Blazers. It's Blazers Spurs. Why is that game so huge for the Pacers? Because someone's going to win. Someone is going to win. If the Blazers win, They'll have 34 wins, which is the same number the Pacers have. That adds another team into the mix for that five, six, seven, eight tie break range. Who's going to emerge with the best and worst spot from that group remains to be seen, but a Blazers win could help the Pacers lottery odds in that way. But there's a flip side to this. A Spurs win would give the Spurs 21 wins and the Rockets have 20 and the Pacers only get the Rockets second round pick if it's in the top two of the second round. So they would love the Spurs to emerge with more wins than the Rockets this season. And that is the most winnable game on the Spurs schedule. The Spurs play at home against the Blazers at home against the Timberwolves and then at Dallas in their last game, Dallas could be playing for the plan. Timberwolves still are playing for the plan. So this game could go either way. And I am receptive to both lines of thinking as who the Pacers would prefer to win. You know, if the Blazers win, sure, the Pacers could, in theory, have slightly better lottery odds, but they could also not because they could just end up beating the Pistons Friday. They could also lose a coin flip, and then it doesn't matter. There's a lot of layers to that. Uh, But increased lottery odds, always good, right? You cannot argue against that versus the flip side is getting the 32nd pick, whereas if the Rockets pick is 33rd, it goes to the Celtics, and then the Pacers would probably get Miami second, which is going to be like 50, and like 32 and 50 is a big gap. So what's better, right? in the draft pick six 25 29 and 50 or pick seven or excuse me pick five 25 29 and 32 you know you have to figure out what's better of that calculus i might have just said something wrong because i wasn't looking at a sheet or anything um but what's better a slightly potentially better first round pick and a way better second or a slightly worse first and a way worse second. They have to figure that out. And so I th- I just said it wrong twice. Either way, you get the gist. Whatever you think would be more valuable, a way better second could allow the Pacers to have more move-up packages. Uh, a better first gives them a better chance at moving up. But it's still the lottery where there's a lot of luck involved. Either team winning, is someone's going to win, and the Pacers will get clarity on that. The Rockets, who the Pacers want to lose both of their last games, so a Spurs win would be important. They close with two cupcake opponents, <laughs> the Hornets and the Wizards. They are both on the road. Uh, they did just play their final home game earlier this week, so that bodes well for the Pacers. The Wizards uh, are battling for postseason, or excuse me, for lottery positioning, whereas the Hornets are not. They're locked into the fourth worst odds, so it seems like the Hornets should be a game that they, they beat the Rockets, but the Wizards one's going to be fascinating to see how that goes. Pacers will help the Rockets lose both because that guarantees them, at worst, a coin flips chance at keeping that second-round pick. The Spurs, who I just said, close with Dallas, San Antonio, and they play Portland tonight. So there's a lot of, of interesting stuff going on with all these teams. Pacers are hoping for the teams right around them in the first-round pick standings to win, and they want the Rockets to lose in these last couple games i don't care what fans of the pacers decide to root for if you want your team to win root for them to win if you want them to lose root for them to lose but that is the situation of all the teams around the pacers the jazz technically still something the pacers care about if the pacers win both of their games they would get to 36 wins that's what the jazz have now Uh, but even just one more loss by the pacers or one win by the jazz would confirm the pacers into somewhere between five and eight i've been saying for a little over a month now that the range to me for the pacers is that five to eight range We're very close to that being concrete now, given how things have shaken up around the league. A lot of teams are locked into playoff or play-in positioning, but maybe not a specific seed. So the the funky part of all this is who's going to try, right? Who's going to try in these games and who isn't? That's a big determining factor 
that the Pacers have to care about. The Cavs, by virtue of this Grizzlies loss earlier today, the Pacers, remember, own the Cavs' first-round pick. That pick could be 26th now because the Grizzlies lost. Both those teams are 50 and 30, and the Grizzlies, fortunately for the Pacers, are still battling to clinch the second seed in the West. They might try one of their last two games where the Cavs have no incentive to tie, so uh, Pacers are big Grizzlies fans. Going forward, looking very likely the Cavs pick will be 25 or 26. And then Boston has locked up second seed in the East. They are one win away or one Philly loss away from that pick being locked into 29. So it's looking very likely the Pacers first round will be their own pick and then 25 or 26 and then 29. And they're hoping for good second round luck as well. Hope that wasn't all too confusing. But if you have questions, I'm on Twitter at T East NBA. And the show is at Locked On Pacers back tomorrow. Talking Pistons, young players, and the close to the season all on Locked On Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every day. We're free and available on all platforms. Hope everybody had a fun and fantastic game day. We'll see you tomorrow.